I love the challenges the law presents. Um, I love, it's like a, a, a puzzle in trying to solve the issues. Um, I love working with smart law clerks and the like. You're not uh, asked to do this job because of personal beliefs. You're asked to do the job because uh, someone thinks that you can be fair and uh, rule in accordance with the law. And that's our job. And yet, we're human beings, aren't we? And we all have beliefs and we all have, uh, we come from different backgrounds and we have different uh, life experiences. And uh, we all bring that to the table when we are uh, in the judging business. Detroit, Michigan on the east side at Harbor, View, uh, Harbor Hospital and uh, it was, uh, I hate to say the date, it's long ago, January 1 of 1935. Wow. New Year's Day. New Year's Day. Roosevelt was president, uh, uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt. The economic times were fairly stark. Uh, we were in a depression. Uh, things were heating up in Europe. Um, it was, it was not a pleasant time, I think, for people who were, were in the working community. And I was a, quite a small uh, little tyke. I weighed about four and a half pounds at the time, stayed in the hospital for a few weeks as a result of being so small, but uh, it didn't slow me down, I guess. He got his first name, Thomas, from his maternal grandfather and his middle name, Samuel, from his paternal grandfather. Both were Irish Americans. Both of his grandmothers were German Americans. My grandmother came over from uh, Germany as a 13-year-old young girl by herself. Her, some of her siblings had come over earlier. So there was a German community there in Aurora as I was growing up. His father, George Samuel Zilly, who went by Sam, was the second oldest of 11 siblings. Dad. Uh, grew up and was the first person in his family to go to college. He graduated from the University of Illinois. One of Sam Zilly's Illinois classmates was Bernice McWinney. But she was very involved and, and very political and very uh, knowledgeable in that area. I think she went back and got a master's degree when she moved to Detroit, after she moved to Detroit. She was a, a teacher then for many years. They were married on um, uh, November 30 of 1930. Uh, we have a picture of them standing on a, by a car that was taken generally about the time they were married as well. The Great Depression swept the nation. Sam jumped on the only job offer he received after college as a salesman for Detroit Edison. The young couple moved to Gross Point. Gross Point was where all uh, leaders of the various uh, car companies lived in these huge estates. We didn't have anything like that. We lived in a fairly modest house, but you know, within a couple miles of us lived uh, the Fords and the Hudsons and the Dodges and every imaginable leader of the big car company. On December 7th, 1941, three weeks before Tom Zilly turned seven, America entered World War II. I remember my father being a warden, so he would go around and make sure everybody had their lights out uh, uh, at night, and, and I would go with him. I can remember at some point during the war, having heard that we were in, having a war with uh, Germany, I wondered, and I asked my mother, you know, what would, the, what would Germans look like? And she, I never forget this. She said, you know, both of your grandmothers were born in Germany. And it was an eye opener because I realized that we were at war with people that were just like us and who were family. And, you know, it didn't quite understand why this was all happening at the time. Uh, but uh, I was, I was, I'll never forget her telling me that. The war years were still school years for Tom. He and his sister Barbara had a Catholic education early on, 
But when Tom insisted on a public high school, his mother resisted. Their compromise was Marmion Military Academy in Aurora, Illinois. And it's a, it was a Catholic school, it was a military school, and it was a boarding school. And it's a very strong academic school. I went there and realized after about six months of wearing a uniform and being hazed and getting demerits and uh, all that it was really a terrible mistake that I, I wanted to come home and, you know, go anywhere but Marmion. Uh, but those were the days when parents kind of ruled and they said, no, you have to stay the year. So, okay, I stayed the year. He ended up staying all four years, making rebellious peace with military discipline. He joined the debate team and looked forward to college. I applied and got into two schools, Holy Cross. That was my, that was to placate my mother. But uh, I also applied and got into the University of Michigan. And of course, the price was right. I was an in-state student and it was, it was a wonderful university. I still is, of course. Um, but it was overwhelming in sense. Uh, it was so huge. I got it into school early and graduated early and 17 was just too early to go to the University of Michigan, this huge school, and be kind of uh, uh, out there. While in college, he was drawn to the wide open spaces of the American West, a favorite destination for his family's vacations. The year I graduated from high school, they went to Glacier National Park and I decided I'd get off the bus literally, and stay there and work the summer. Uh, and I was able to do that. The next summer I went back. It was not very glamorous. I was a cabin boy. I cleaned up the cabins. I was there with a bunch of other college kids, working uh, and hiking and uh, just exploring the, the, the beautiful scenery that they have there. It certainly got me interested in mountains and hiking, and one of the my uh, uh, illusions was that I would ultimately move to Seattle and Washington so I could run back to Glacier or Montana and hike, not realizing what beauty in the mountains we had here in Washington. Back at Michigan, he dated fellow student Ruth Flanders. He joined Beta Theta Pi fraternity, earning room, board, and tuition, selling life insurance. Selling life insurance um, can't be easy. I mean, what, what, what was that like? It was interesting. You have to go out and sell yourself. Um, I concentrated on people who were in uh, dental school, medical school, at the University of Michigan, or engineering, and, uh, uh, and got lists of who they were and made contacts. And the philosophy was, I guess it's still the philosophy in terms of selling things, that if you could make uh, contact with seven people in a particular segment of the population, uh, you would make one sale. On graduating with a pre-law degree in 1956, he entered Naval Officer Candidate School. Got a commission and I was, I was naive enough to say, well, gosh, if I'm gonna be in the Navy, I should see the whole experience. I wanna to go to sea, I wanna be on a destroyer. Was at sea all the time. And I didn't realize it, but I would get seasick from time to time when we'd go out in the rough seas. Oh, but we're, we're in Cold War mode, I mean, we're, out running around the Caribbean, chasing Rus Russian submarines on a regular basis. In August, we had the Beirut crisis, and we were uh, off uh, Beirut about uh, 2,000 yards, uh, assisting while the Marines went ashore. Saw all sorts of, of cities in the, in the Mediterranean. Each year, we went through the Suez. Each year, we went up into the Persian Gulf, and each year, we literally went up to the, into Iraq. There, I learned all about the Uniform Military Code and, uh, and ultimately was the legal officer on the ship and uh, prosecuted several uh, summary judgments and the like uh, while we were at sea and, uh, and advised the captain on discipline for people. 
And so there was a lot of bureaucracy. There was a lot of, I don't want to say incompetence, but uh, a, a level of, of uh, competence that perhaps wasn't as great as I was uh, hoping that I would be able to associate with. So I kind of decided, uh, you know, three years working for the federal government is enough, and I'll never do that again. What a surprise. <laughs> he shipped off to Cornell for law school. Only one in 10 of his classmates had served in the military. That's a huge advantage because I knew what I wanted to do. I'd had all these experiences. I'd had all these people working for me. I'd had all this responsibility. Um, and I knew I wanted to be a lawyer, and I knew I wanted to work hard. And I, and I worked very hard. I mean, I, I was putting in seven or eight hours a day of studying every day. I was motivated, and I was uh, several years older than most of the classmates. I was married. I was grounded. And it really helped. He was selected managing editor of the Law Review. That helped get a clerking position and eventual job offer from a big firm in San Francisco. The other place that I interviewed got an offer and wondered whether I always wondered whether I should have taken was in Burlington, Vermont. The largest firm in the state. They had three lawyers and they needed a fourth. I went up and interviewed. I went up and interviewed the week after my son John was born. My wife's in the hospital and I go up and interview and, and we're thinking about you know the Northeast and Burlington, Vermont. And you know, it would have been a wonderful life, I'm sure, in Burlington, Vermont. But big cities, particularly in the West, held more appeal. He was hired by the Seattle firm Evans McLaren Lane Powell and Moss, just as William Beeks left the firm to become a federal judge. It was a small 15-person firm. It was the third biggest firm in town at the time. When I joined, they agreed to pay me the lofty sum of $450 a month. And uh, when I passed the bar, which I did uh, the summer of uh, 62, the, they upped it to $500. Coming out of law school, I was very interested, taken by the tax cases, uh, courses that I've taken, and, and the professors uh, had a big influence on me, the corporate and tax professors. Um, and I came out and started doing tax work and found that it was not as interesting um, as I had hoped. Uh, I got uh, immersed in uh, a couple of big estate tax returns, which consumed most of my time. And, and it, it just wasn't as uh, intellectually challenging. Um, and uh, along the way, people would bring in files and say, you know, you could go down and argue this motion in superior court, um, it might give you a, a, a little variety. And I started doing that. And after six or eight months, I realized that I really enjoyed going to court. And I really didn't want to be a tax lawyer all my life. Um, and the litigation and the, the, the ability to go down and argue cases and, and write briefs uh, were uh, much more appealing to me. And so Tom Zilly became a litigator. He chaired a national conference seeking ways to improve courts of limited jurisdiction. And he occasionally sat in as a municipal court pro tem judge. Even though he loved practicing law, he was increasingly drawn to adjudicating the law. You don't really see these roads, do you, when you're, when you're going through them. But, but they're important roads in your life. And, and you make these decisions and it so impacts who you are and what you do. The Pacific Northwest proved a good match for Tom Zilly's personal life, too. Outdoor activities like the YMCA Indian Guides and the Boy Scouts of America were a big part of his relationship with his four children, all of them boys. The sons are John, oldest, Peter, Paul, and Luke. And we sometimes refer to them as the Bible boys because of their names. The scouting program allowed us to have a really great um, excuse, if you will, but to go out into the wilderness. I took uh, two 50-mile hikes uh, in two different summers with the kids. Uh, uh, you know, I never would have done that. We crossed the Olympics one year. In the early 1970s, Seattle struggled to integrate its public schools. 
Tom Zilly was elected to a council representing schools most affected by desegregation. The idea was to have all of the schools more diverse. We came up with the idea of busing, which was very controversial. But it was an eye-opener for me as a person who had kind of grown up in a not very diverse community uh, to uh, spend a lot of time with people of, uh, different, of different colors, um, and particularly in the black community, and uh, learn a lot about what they thought and how they, um, they had the same needs we had, and, and uh, it, it, it helped me forge who I am today. When I was remembering a situation where I was a young kid and driving the car at age 16 and with a little beer in the car and the uh, police officer, I was, a, I was a freshman in high school, police officer pulls me over, we've been throwing the beer cans out as we've gone over, and I tried to elude the cop. <laughs> you know, I mean, it could have been a serious situation. He was my uh, uh, eighth grade basketball coach, the cop. And you know, he, how you doing, Tom? And what's going on? And you know, this is not a good thing. And gave me a lecture and I went home. You know, if, and that happened in, in the Gross Point area, maybe two miles from the Detroit border, boundary, you know, if it had been, if I'd been black and I'd been in the Detroit area could have affected my whole life. In 1978, the Washington State Bar Association asked Zilly to head up a study exploring how law schools might improve their affirmative action policies. I wrote a report, was in the Bar News, and then the Washington Women Lawyers, the next issue, came out with this big le letter uh, saying how uh, off base the Zilly report was. The author of that critical letter was a lawyer named Jane Noland. After Zilly's first marriage ended, he and Noland would cross paths again in 1986 when he was elected president of the King County Bar Association. On the bar board at the time was an, a person called Jane Noland who had practiced law at, uh, was practicing law at Perkins and uh, was on that bar board. And really we became acquainted through our bar activities and ultimately uh, became married in 1988. And his family now included Jane's daughters, Allison and Jennifer. Several months before the wedding, Zilly litigated a trial in Seattle's federal courthouse. I had uh, tried a case before uh, Judge McGovern and uh, at some point I was walking down the street in 1987, I believe, and his law clerk approached me and said, the judge would like you to know that he's going to be going senior and there's going to be an opening. And I thought, well, that's good news. And so I applied uh, to become a judge. It wasn't, of course, that simple. For one, he'd never been a judge other than those municipal pro tem assignments. But Washington's U.S. Senators, Dan Evans and Brock Adams, backed his nomination, and he soon found himself in Washington, D.C., in front of the Senate Judiciary Committee. We get this um, note that comes in saying that uh, uh, Strom Thurmond wishes to speak to me before the hearing. And I'm thinking, wow, I'm going to get shot down. I went over to the hearing and, well, Mr. Zealy, I see that you've done a lot of civil work, but you've never done any criminal work. What are you going to do to uh, uh, get up to speed on criminal work? And my answer, of course, was, well, the courtroom is the courtroom. I'm very familiar and comfortable in the courtroom, and the rules of evidence are the same. And as far as the criminal law is concerned, I'm going to uh, go to school uh, to learn uh, the, the nuances of criminal law and uh, talk to my colleagues, and I think I'm fully... Up, I can be up to speed. He was very satisfied with that answer. So satisfied that Senator Thurmond addressed him as judge even before the committee officially approved the nomination. He was sworn in and first took the bench on April 30th, 1988. You know, the fact that we get this job, we still put our pants on one leg at a time, and that we shouldn't take ourselves as being uh, overly important in any way. We're We're just part of a 
wonderful judicial system. And uh, so you can come here and be a judge, but you should know that uh, um, others have come before you and others will come after you and you need to do a professional job. The abundant natural resources that had so attracted Judge Zilly to the Pacific Northwest became the subject of several landmark lawsuits. When government biologists wrote an opinion concluding that the northern spotted owl needed protection, the Reagan administration refused to list the bird under the Endangered Species Act. Just months into his judgeship, Zilly ruled that the administration's refusal had been arbitrary and capricious. The spotted owl case it had a lot of repercussions, but it was really an easy case because all of the scientists agreed that it was the spotted owl was threatened. And yet the administration at that time, 1988, decided not to follow the biological opinions and to decide it on a political basis. And they just ignored the, the science. But contrary to the Endangered Species Act, when you list something as endangered or threatened, you also are required, at simultaneously, the government is required to uh, create a critical habitat. And they didn't do that. Uh, and so again, they came back and ultimately I ordered them to do the critical habitat. But as everybody knows, as a result of those decisions, logging in the old growth forests, the seven million acres in the Northwest, uh, uh, the Olympic Peninsula, and down into all of the coastal mountains of Oregon was pretty much shut down. And then uh, logging had to be uh, case by case. Uh, logging sale had to be analyzed for whether or not it, how it would impact the spotted owl. And there were several years when I, I was not comfortable in going over to Forks Washington or some of the logging communities were uh, most unhappy with Judge Zilly, and uh, it was a it was it was a decision that was easy to make because the, it was so clear what the result should be, and yet I was so surprised at the 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 amount of the fallout and the amount of the, what happened as a result. And that fallout continued. Up in Alaska, stellar sea lions ate pollock, a fish also favored by commercial fishermen. When biologists listed stellars as endangered, Judge Zilly banned fishing near sea lion rookeries in the Gulf of Alaska and Aleutian Islands. You know, the Endangered Species Act was something I had never really been involved with before I became a judge. I mean, it was all new, new, uh, new field. I mean, that's one of the wonderful things about this job is that uh, we get to learn about and deal with issues and a variety of issues that we've really not had an experience with before getting involved. I mean, I, I was not an endangered species uh, person or expert before I became a judge, and six months later they give me the spotted owl case to decide. And I, I, I had several other cases, and then ultimately the stellar sea lion took over my life for three years or so, and Whereas before it was the loggers, this time it was the fishermen that were most unhappy with Judge Zelly. More controversial cases followed. Mitchell Roop, a convicted murderer, had grown obese on death row. Roop argued that his scheduled execution by hanging would be unconstitutional. But his claim there was that he was essentially too fat to be hung. And uh, uh, I, it was unbelievable. I sat in this court for a week listening to all this testimony about how, how th thick the rope would be and how long the drop and etc. Ultimately, I concluded that there was a substantial likelihood that if he were hung because of his weight, he would be decapitated and that that was cruel and unusual under the Constitution. And it got a lot of press, I mean, all over the world. I mean, I had some friends in Paris at the time who sent me a news clip, you know, and how can this possibly be? You know, in this business, half the people don't like what you do. So you start with that proposition. And, uh, but 
Uh, and you never know for sure what's going to draw the people out of the woodwork. I think more than 50% of all the death penalties have been overturned by federal judges. Now that tells me that um, the, the system is not working exactly the way it should in the state system. Um, and uh, that uh, check and balance, the federal courts being able to step in and rule is, is, is good, but uh, it shouldn't be that way. I mean, we should be granting relief in just a small portion of the cases if, if the system works right. Sometimes federal judges use their power to look beyond onerous statutes to reach just results. In the early 1990s, Judge Zilly's hands seemed to be tied by strict sentencing guidelines when it was time to send a convicted drug dealer to prison. I gave him 30 years. I didn't like it. I did it because of the guidelines. Um, at some point, he filed a writ of a writ of Corella. I'd never heard of such a writ. There's only been three or four cases ever reported about this writ. It's basically, if all else fails, and it's just basic uh, uh, unfair what's happened, there ought to be some justice in the world. Here's a, here's a writ. Um, uh, that sat on my desk for a couple of years where I... I wanted to do something, but my law clerk said, Judge, you can't do anything. This is hopeless. Ultimately, I concluded in the order I wrote that when I sentenced him, I sentenced him to 30 years only because of these guidelines. The Supreme Court and Booker, the Booker decision, decided that the guidelines were unconstitutional. They also decided they were not retroactive because it wasn't a fundamental change in the law. What can be more fundamental, in my opinion? I felt that, um, the, and, and I say in my order, that I would never have given him 30 years but for this law, which has now been declared unconstitutional. And I think the fundamental justice requires that we resentence and we give him a, a, an appropriate sentence under all the circumstances. You know, I've sentenced a lot of people to jail, but the hearing I had on the re, when I resentenced him was one of the most remarkable hearings I've ever had. And he came to court, I mean, he was in custody. He'd been in custody for 20 years. And he talked about his life in prison, how he had gone into prison being this young, uh, angry guy who felt that the world, des that he, deser he deserved to sell cocaine and make money and live the good life. And he was an angry guy. He'd lost his family because of the conviction. Um, and he uh, ultimately uh, was taken under the wing by a guy who was there for life, an African-American guy he became friended with. And, and he said, the guy turned me around in terms of looking at who I am and my responsibilities in the world. And he'd behaved himself in prison. I was interested in that. I didn't want to do something for him if he you know, had been messing up in prison. But after about an hour of his talking and our arguing back and forth, the government resisted. I resentenced him to time served, and he walked out of prison that day. And, you know, uh, and his sons, who he had lost touch with because they were young kids when he was originally sentenced, ultimately were there in, in court, and, and he had reconnected with them. And it was a, 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 just a, uh, I'm really one of the, Good things I did as a judge. In 1994, an army colonel entered Judge Zilly's courtroom. Trained as a nurse, her name was Margaret Kammermeyer. She was a remarkable army officer in the Army National Guard. She was a colonel in the Washington State uh, National Guard. She, she had been to Vietnam and gotten a bronze star. She was a superstar. But while seeking admission to the Army War College, Kammermeyer had been asked about her sexual orientation. She told the truth. She's a lesbian. Under long-standing Pentagon policy, she was summarily discharged. I found that her constitutional rights were violated and that the discharge was wrongful, and I ordered her reinstated. And, you know, for, for our society to take these people who are 
on their own merits so terrific and discriminate against them for any reason is uh, just uh, not, not something that we should tolerate. Uh, looking back, it was uh, pushing the envelope in terms of the judicial precedent, and yet from a fairness standpoint, what was the right answer? It was an easy call. So, uh, but sometimes those easy calls, you have to kind of go out on the thin ice, and I was out on the thin ice. In 2003, Judge Zilli moved to senior status, keeping him on the bench, but offering a bit more time to pursue his many passions. That was actually pretty good for an old guy. Judge Zilli has played squash since he was 35 years old. Highly competitive, he often qualifies for national tournaments. But even there, he sometimes faces controversial decisions. And I had the fortune or misfortune of playing in the Nationals a few years ago and actually called a stroke against myself when the referee was unwilling to do so, and it was the final point of the fourth game and led to the fifth game and I lost to the number one seed in the tournament because of the lead I called on myself. So, well, Very bad call. <laughs> we have a cabin down near Crystal Mountain and uh, probably 15 years ago we started what's known as the Zilli Olympics. Well, the events are horseshoes, obstacle croquet, push-ups, pull-ups, uh, Texas Hold'em, trivial pursuits, and maybe cookie baking one year. One year we had to uh, make uh, paper airplanes and see how far they fly. The obstacle croquet is always the favorite event. Uh, it takes two to three hours to play one game. It's been going on for a long time. We have a trophy. Uh, one of my sons is now the holder of the trophy. I've won the event twice, only one other person has won the event twice. Judge Zilli's competitive instincts spill over to the courtroom. The opportunity for impassioned but civil disagreement and debate was one of the main reasons he became a lawyer. The culture has changed. I mean, when I was practicing law, one of the fun things about litigating was negotiating with the other side and coming up with a strategy and uh, going back and forth and having that uh, dialogue and settling cases. That was, that was fun. That was a part of the, the job description. Lawyers now don't know how to talk to each other. They don't know how to start any kind of dialogue. They don't, I mean, when they go to mediation, they have never talked. The plaintiff has never made an offer of any kind the defendant has no clue what the plaintiff wants. I mean, it's ridiculous. I always, if in my cases, if I do, I can still send them to mediation. And occasionally, you know, I ask them, I say, do you want to go to mediation? If they say yes, fine. But I say, if you're going to do that, talk a little before, get, the, get a demand, get a, a response, know kind of what you're talking about. Yeah. We all have a lot of work that we do right in the in the uh, in the office. It's uh, it's too bad in a way, but uh, litig federal litigation has turned into a lot of uh, paper filings and and rulings on the paper. Frequently, there's no oral argument. Um, that's too bad, I think. But that's what's happening now. So uh, we spend a lot of time in our office reading briefs, talking with law clerks. And, uh, and, and deciding a lot of cases where, uh, or issues relating to those cases where the lawyers never show up, we're never in the courtroom. All rise, please. The United States District Court for the Western District of Washington is now in session. The Honorable Thomas S. Zilley presiding. 
Judge Zilli served on the U.S. Judicial Conference Advisory Committee on Bankruptcy Rules, serving as chair from 2004 to 2007, even as he continued managing a full federal court caseload. As a senior judge, he's been on the bench throughout the Ninth Circuit, as far away as Guam. But his favorite assignments have been in Manhattan. You know, for the last five years, every year, every spring, I've gone back to uh, sit in the Southern District of New York for two weeks, trying jury cases, civil cases. And it's been, uh, it's great fun. It's, they do business a little differently, uh, so I always learn something new. Uh, they've been very, uh, uh, they've had a lot of judges that they were on order but hadn't arrived, and so they had a need for a substitute or, or judges, and I've gone back, and we love Manhattan, so it's been fun to stay in Manhattan and take the subway to work and try cases uh, there. By 2015, the Zilly Nolan family included their six children and 12 grandchildren, most gathered at Sun Valley to celebrate Judge Zilly's 80th birthday. Coming to work today, I realized that I've been a judge longer than I was a lawyer. Just kind of crossed over that bridge. <laughs> I mean, it didn't happen yesterday or the day before, but it's within the last six months. I mean, it's hard to believe. After 27 years on the bench, the King County Bar Association honored him as Judge of the Year, an award named after the late federal judge Bill Dwyer, his friend and colleague on the bench. So what makes a good judge? It is someone who's uh, unbiased, uh, who has, uh, uh, is able to consider and be fair to the litigants uh, so when they get through with the process, uh, and I hope it's due process, uh, they recognize whether they've won or lost that they've had a fair jurist who has considered all of the arguments and applied the law as it as should be appropriately applied. It's a lifetime appointment. Can you see that you're doing this until oh. the day before you die? Or? Oh, the day after. <laughs> I, I, yes, I, I think I told you uh, some time ago that my, uh, you know, I'm hoping uh, Wesley uh, Brown, I think the Kansas judge who uh, was trying cases at 103. I hope to break that record by some. Uh, but sure, I, as long as I can do it uh, and uh, enjoy doing it, I, I look forward to it. For a lawyer, and then a, it, 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 it's a natural progression. If you love the law and you love trying cases, you love being in the courtroom, this is the best job in the world. <laughs>